Okay, today uh, we'll wrap up ISA. This was my intent last in the last lecture, but we covered a lot of interesting things, so we, we couldn't finish it. But we'll wrap up the ISA uh, discussions and we'll get into actually microarchitecture, designing a single cycle microarchitecture. And my hope is to finish everything related to single cycle microarchitecture today uh, and hopefully convince you that that's not a good way of designing machines. And we will move on to other ways of designing machines. We'll cover many, many different ways over the course of this class. But this is a very basic way of designing machines, which just doesn't work. Hopefully you'll be convinced of that. Okay, but it's always good to know what doesn't work so that you can design something better, right? Uh, what are the disadvantages of a previous thing? Homework, zoo, uh, homework zero uh, It was due Wednesday. I think I received 34 of them and maybe 35, depending on uh, what my TAs received, which is less than the number of students registered for the class. So there's a mismatch here. Either five people are going to drop the class or, or four people are, uh, six people are going to drop the class or I, they're not going to get a grade. Okay. Uh, and you know the homework assignment, so I'm not going to belabor these. Uh, and the lab assignment also. Please attend the lab sessions, uh, especially. A note on lab and homework uh, due dates. Uh, this was one of the comments that I read. I've, I'm going through your 34 sheets. And one of the comments said, uh, it'd be good to know the dates of these. These dates are actually in your syllabus. Uh, so you can take a look at your syllabus. Uh, we list the dates when the homework and lab assignments are expected to be out and due. So take a look at them. We'll try to stick to those dates, but we may uh, make some accommodations. Again, remember that this is a compile time, static schedule. There may be dynamic events that change our schedule. We'll get back to that again. Uh, and also, you can take a look at last year's website. Uh, this can provide you a good look ahead into what is coming. Uh, you can think of the lecture, you can think of this class as a program, right? We've executed, we've already executed this program once uh, last year. That was the first time I taught the class. And the inputs were different, of course. The students were, <laughs> were different. It wasn't you taking the class. At least I hope not. Actually, I, I, know that, I know that that's not the case. And I was different and everything else, the TAs were different. So we've already execute that, executed this program. So you already have a profile of that execution. You know what is likely to happen. And you can predict what may be coming, right? This is very similar to what we do in computer architecture. You already execute, execute a part of the program and you predict what will happen later. So we will see a lot of mechanisms uh, in lecture where the machine does exactly this thing. And I'm suggesting you to take a look at uh, what happened in the last execution of this uh, course also, especially if you want to see what's coming ahead in the labs and lectures. This can, this can help you prepare uh, for the course even better. And we have all the material online, including solutions to homeworks. So I'll tell you this from now on. Uh, and some of the homework questions will stay the same. But as I said earlier, uh, the goal of the homeworks is to have you understand the material, not to get a grade. So I'd encourage you to do the, uh, solve the questions yourself. You can, you can certainly go and look at the website and check your answers. That's, I have no problem with that. But the purpose of the homework is not to give you a grade. The purpose of the homework is for you to understand the material. So even if the answers are online, I don't really care about that that much, as long as you understand the material. Okay? All right, readings for our next lecture. Uh, we're going to cover into a lot of interest, uh, cover a lot of interesting stuff, hopefully. We'll start uh, with multi-cycle microprogram microarchitectures uh, in the next lecture, assuming we can finish single cycle architecture, uh, microarchitectures today. So these are the readings. Uh, I've already assigned this reading earlier, so some of you may have already done this, but in the next lecture, we'll certainly cover the microarchitecture of the LC3D uh, in a microcoded uh, micro, uh, microarchitecture. And Appendix A will be useful in following this because Appendix A is the ISA itself. Uh, Patterson and Hennessy Appendix D, I think it's still Appendix D, this covers uh, microcoded microarchitectures in uh, MIPS. So this is also an equivalent of uh, what you will see uh, in LC3B. So it's good to look at both, I would, I would say. But I'll mainly go, th go through this Appendix C. Okay, and there is this optional reading, uh, which I like. This is actually the first paper that proposed microprogramming as a way of designing microarchitectures. And if you don't understand anything 
from microprogramming, this will become clear. Uh, and this is Maurice Wilk's paper. Uh, he called it the best way to design an automatic calculating machine. I guess it was the best way at that time. You'll see that there are much better ways today. But it's a beautiful way of designing a computer, an automatic, automatic calculating machine. OK, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that, too. This may be a little bit tough to go through. That's why it's optional. But it's a historical reading for you. OK. Uh, a little bit review of last lecture. I'm not going to cover this because we haven't fully finished the ISA trade-offs, but we may get back to this, and this is certainly for your benefit. In the last lecture, we covered complex versus simple instructions, the concept of the semantic gap, CISC versus RISC ISAs. Uh, we looked at the use of translation to change the trade-offs in semantic gap, what goes into hardware, what goes into software. We looked at several ISA features, fixed versus variable length instructions, uniform versus non-uniform decode. And we ended up at the number of registers. Hopefully you remember the, all of these trade-offs. If not, right now everything, you're fetching everything into your caches. Right. Good. Uh, I'm not going to answer these questions. I'll just pose them so that you can think of them uh, later or when you go through the slides. Because we've covered this. I guess we've beaten to this to death almost. What is the benefit of translating complex instructions to simple instructions before executing them? You can think about. Uh, what is the implication on the software and hardware? Hardware. You can do this in hardware, a la Intel and AMD processors today. You take CISC complex operations and in hardware translate them to what is called micro operations or ROPs, risk operations. I will remember that. Uh, or you could do this in software. You can take an x86 program and in software translate it into a different ISA. Now this changes the trade-offs in semantic gap and Hopefully, you're very familiar with what uh, that implies in terms of the complexity of the hardware, complexity of the software, uh, and how that affects the programmer and the microarchitect. Okay. Uh, another question: Which ISA is easier to extend? The answer to this, the answer to this, is actually in the last lecture: fixed length versus variable length. I'll give you the answer: it's variable length, right? Fixed length is hard to extend. Once you run out of opcodes, you're done. Right? But variable length, you can keep adding. Uh, more bytes to an instruction, which is what's, what was happening with x86. Does anybody know what's the longest instruction you can have in x86 today? 17 bytes. 17 bytes? So I was right. I thought it was 17 bytes too, but it may, it may have increased. <laughs> Did you check? <laughs> yeah, I, th I, th I thought it was 17 bytes, but the ISA keeps evolving very quickly. So when I first looked at the ISA, I think it was 16 bytes, and then it became 17, yes. What happens if the new instructions becomes extremely popular? So like Intel tries to make the most popular instructions with assurance instructions, right? Mm -hmm. But what if, like, say, they introduce a new completely amazing instruction that does this amazing operation everyone starts using? Mm -hmm. Do they actually go back and change its byte code? Well, that's tough, right? If you change the byte code, now you're breaking backward compatibility. Right. So that's the, that's the difficulty. That's a dilemma. Do you actually reserve some uh, opcodes for those instructions that you do not know that you will support in the future, such that uh, the, uh, the length of the instruction is small? Or do you just keep adding? And uh, if a new instruction becomes popular, well, code size is larger, right, in that case. So that's, uh, that actually affects uh, something else also, right, that you have a good point. Uh, it's very hard to go back and re-encode instructions. But translation, again, can help you, right? If you, if you translate your ISA to a micro ISA, that could help you. You, can, you could break that trade off. But uh, if an instruction uh, is very long, that may hinder its popularity also, right? That's, That's, exactly. It could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you, for example, uh, we talk about Huffman encoding uh, of instruction uh, opcodes in Intel 432, uh, they have decided uh, to assign codes to instructions based on their profile of uh, pro previous programs. Now, it, this can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you assign uh, a small opcode to an instruction that you think is popular, you may ensure that it becomes popular in the future, right? You may encourage programmers to, or compiler writers to make it popular in the future. So what, what choices you make in the architecture actually affect what programs get written also. For example, if you never put support into parallel programming, 
uh, support for parallel programming constructs in your ISA. Uh, for example, locking. And we will see something, some other things later on. Maybe it will become a lot more difficult for the programmers to program in parallel, which means that maybe programmers in the future will not program in parallel. Right? So what you end up putting into your ISA, putting into your hardware software interface, affects what kind of programs will get written also. And those things are very hard to uh, model and imagine, uh, model, uh, model the effects of going into the future, right? Okay? Okay. Uh, how can you have a variable length uniform decode ISA? I'll leave you with this. We kind of had a discussion of this. Oh, wait, this is old. Okay. I should remove that slide. I don't know where that came in from. OK, uh, we saw the x86 versus alpha instruction formats. Uh, and you see how regular and nice alpha is and how irregular x86 is. Uh, although regularity apparently is not the determinant of success in the market, right? Alpha is now pretty much a dead ISA. And x86 is still going strong, although it has a lot of contenders like ARM. Uh, OK, and we've talked about the number of registers. I'm not going to cover this. This is, again, for your benefit. There are positives and negatives to having a large number of registers. But let's take a look at addressing mode. This is something we briefly looked at, but we didn't cover in detail. Uh, I'd like to spend a little, bit of a little bit more time on this. We've talked about auto-increment addressing mode, so you know that very well now. What is the trade-off associated with that? But I'd like to show you how this actually affects uh, the higher levels of programming. This is one nice example of having uh, something in the ISA uh, enabling the compiler to map different access patterns. Uh, addressing mode, remember that it specifies how an operand is obtained, right, uh, for, uh, within an instruction. It could be register, immediate, and there are many memory addressing modes. You can have more mo uh, if you have more modes, the advantage of this is you can help better support programming constructs. This is very clear. We discussed this last time. Arrays, pointer-based accesses, etc. Of course, with every choice we make, there's a downside, right? If you have more modes, this is now made harder for the architect to design. You've got to support all these things. And we'll see some things in x86 architecture that look kind of ugly. Uh, and it's also, it could also be harder for the compiler. Now, compiler has many choices, right? Auto-increment or not auto-increment? Or should I actually use something like an indexed addressing mode or something else, multiple instructions? And many ways to do the same thing complicates compiler design. And a good paper uh, on this is uh, Compilers and Com Computer Architecture by Bill Wolf, uh, written in IEEE Computer, 1981, if you're interested in this. Uh, Bill Wolf talks about how should you design the ISA such that it's friendly to the compiler writer? He's, he's taking the uh, stand of a compiler writer. And what would be a good ISA for them? And uh, the, one of the conclusions is don't give too many ways for the compiler uh, writer uh, to do the same thing. Or if you're going to give too many ways, give clear guidelines as to what is the performance of each of the ways. You'll get this performance if you use this addressing mode, and you'll get this performance if you use that addressing mode. OK, you can take a look at that. OK, so let's take a look at the addressing modes in alpha versus x86. You can see that x86 actually has lots of addressing modes. And in x86, uh, the addressing modes are specified by this mod RM byte and the scale index uh, base byte, SIB byte, and displacement, as well as immediate. These are all addressing mode related parts of the instruction, which is most of the instruction if you look at this, right? You have prefixes and opcode, but to op obtain your operands, uh, you need to have these bytes. Actually, x86 is interesting because you can have an instruction that's one byte. And that specifies implicitly the addressing mode and the opcode itself. For example, you can have an increment instruction that just increments a specific register. Increment EAX. This is one of the registers. Think of this as R1, for example. This has an opcode for itself. Right. One byte. The advantage is if you always do increments on register 1, 
Now you can encode that operation very, very uh, tightly. Right? So you can have very compact code if you do your increments on register 1. Make sense? Because there is a special opcode that specifies both the operation and the operand itself. Okay? But the complicated addressing modes are specified here. You, you don't add uh, the, uh, these addressing modes through memory are not part of the opcode usually. You need to go through this mod RM byte and its IB byte to specify the addresses through memory. I'll just give you an example of the complexity of this. This is all you can find by reading the x86 manual. But let's take a look at uh, what kind of addressing modes we can have in x86 by modifying, having different values for these bytes. And this is not to scare you, although it's partially to scare you as well. <laughs> because some of the addressing modes you can get is, could be scary. And you can only imagine, after, if, you, if you like this, you can go and look at the VAX manual and see how much more scary that is compared to x86. So let's take a look. So what is this? This is a table. Uh, from one version of the x86 ISA manual that shows uh, what happens, how your address is computed depending on the values of the mod, depending on the value in your mod RM byte, basically. If you look at this, mod RM is a byte. It's an 8-bit value. The top three bits is mod, and I don't remember what it exactly stands for. Uh, the bottom three bits specify register versus memory, but that's also overloaded, so it's, there is no clear guideline. And the middle three bits specify register slash opcode, what they call. So if you look at this, this is essentially a table that lists the value of mod bits. Oh, I, did I say top three? It's top two. Mod bits and RM bits and the reg opcode bits here. So you get the five bits here and then three bits here. And this tells you that, for example, if your mod bits are 0, 0 and RM bits are 0, 0, 0, then your effective address is computed in a register indirect way. That's your EX. Right? E, well, the value in your, in your EAX is your address. Make sense? So you basically need to decode those things to figure out what's your address. Uh, you can have an absolute addressing mode if your mod bits are 0, 0, and uh, RM bits are, I guess, 1, 0, 1. The addressing mode is displacement 32. Make sense? And you can have uh, a register plus displacement addressing mode, depending if your mod bits are 1, 0, then this is the addressing mode, register plus displacement. And which register you use depends on the RM bits. Make sense? And you could directly, add, you could have a direct register mode, meaning register is, your, is where your operand is if your mod bits are 1, 1. So you could specify if you're, if, if this is 1, 1, then uh, this RM bit specify which register you operate on. And this, is the, uh, this part is the destination register. You have source and destination, right? OK? So you can, encode, you can decode your addressing modes by just looking at this table. And if you're the hardware designer, you basically implement this table. Hope this is clear. <laughs> but it's fun. Now, it's not. As simple, because there are exceptions, right? If you look at this, there's this weird thing. What is this weird thing? Dot, 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 dot. <laughs> and that happens when your RM bits are uh, 1, 0, 0, at least in three cases. Now you have irregularity in your ISA. It's terrible, right? It doesn't happen here. So if your mod bits are 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, and your RM bits are 0, 0, 0, or, or sorry, 1, 0, 0, then you have this whatever that is, one, let's see. The dash, 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 dash nomenclature means a, a psi b byte follows the mod RM byte. Meaning, if that's the case, uh, if this value is 1, 0, 0, and mod bits are not 1, 1, you will have this byte. So you need to decode what's here to figure out whether you have this byte in the instruction. Now what happens when you have that byte? Well, this happens. You go to another table, and this table specifies uh, what, how your address should be computed uh, depending on the values in your S SIB byte. And what is the SIB byte? If you go back, scale index base. Well, scale index base. And this is how you compute uh, 
the address that way. And what is the address? Basically, this is how the address is computed. Now, instead of having a register indirect here, you have a scaled register value. You can scale the register value by 2, 4, 8. Make sense? Basically, you multiply the value in the register by 2, 4, 8. OK. Is this scary? Yes, to some? Well, we don't have to memorize it. You don't have to. Exactly. You don't have to memorize it. This is all the ISA designer specified it for you. And you're not going to implement this, by the way. This is not, this is not, your, lecture assi this is not your assignment for the lab. But you can imagine what you would need to implement if this course was based on x86 instead of MIPS. And I'll take your vote at the end of the class, uh, at the end of uh, the semester, to see if you really want this or you want to continue with MIPS for the future generations. But uh, this does give you the complexity associated with a variable length ISA that has evolved over the uh, years. Yes. What's the value of having like a one by instruction? Won't that have to be like word aligned? So in the end, aren't you not really saving space? No, x86. We'll get to alignment, but x86 uh, poses no restrictions on alignment. So you can pack instructions much better. OK? <laughs> That's <laughs> but yes, if you need to have things word aligned, then you may have issues. OK, so uh, you, can, you can have fun with this. Uh, but let's take a step back and look at what is the benefit of having these addressing modes. We have all these addressing modes. Yes, we need to implement them by implementing this table in hardware somehow. But what is the benefit? And this is, again, from the x86 manual. And I had to update this number because x86 manual keeps changing. It used to be page 331. Now it's page 322. I have to main maintain coherence with the <laughs> x86 manual. But uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is the effective address computation. And this is the most complicated address you can have. You can have a base register plus uh, an index register scaled by some value plus some displacement that comes from the instruction. Remember this displacement? It could be one, two, four byte displacement. You can have all of these values, and this will be your final address. Now you can imagine why this is, uh, why do you want all of these things? Well, x86 manual actually tells you this also. If you go through this, they, uh, I just copied some parts of it, actually. The actual section is pretty instructive, I think, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. The following addressing modes suggest uses for common combinations of address components. Uh, for example, a displacement alone represents a direct offset to the operand. It is commonly used to access a statically allocated sta scalar operand. Make sense? So actually, this is called an offset. There's another base. So if you read the section, you'll understand what it is. But I'll give you uh, a this is just to give you what kind of uh, access patterns can be supported. Like base plus displacement, you probably have a good idea of why that's a good idea, a good thing, right? Anybody? Without reading that, yes. Arrays. Arrays, yes. You have, if you want to index into an array, uh, when the element size is not two, four, or eight bytes, right? When the element size is one byte, you can index nicely. If it's two, four, or eight bytes, now you can have indexed uh, access, which we will see next. Uh, or, uh, so if you have this, in this case, the displacement component encodes a static offset to the beginning of the array. The base register holds the results of a calculation to determine the offset to a specific element within the array. You could do it this way. This is one way of using it, if you know the static address of the beginning uh, of the array. Uh, or to access a field of a record. The base register holds the address of the beginning of the record, while the displacement is a static offset to the field. Right. So if you have... Mm, if you have a struct right, with a bunch of fields, maybe uh, this could be a node struct, right? And you could have a pointer to the next node. And you'll have, uh, I don't know, maybe a character array of data. And maybe you'll have some flag, right? Flag x, flag y. If you know the base address of the struct, of, the, of a particular object, then you can store in displacement how far away from the base address one of the fields is. Right. So that's one way of uh, taking advantage of this uh, 
addressing mode. Now you can imagine many different ways. This just gives you examples. Now you can ask why, why do you want the more complicated ones? Well, more complicated ones enable you to do more complicated things. For example, if you have index times scale plus displacement, this address mode offers an efficient way to index into a static array when the element size is 2, 4, or 8 bytes. So this enables you to avoid one additional instruction to multiply uh, part of the address with 2, 4, or 8, right? because the instruction itself does it for you. And if you want to do a base, uh, what is base plus index plus displacement good for? Using two registers together supports either a two-dimensional array, the displacement holds the address of the beginning of the array, or one of several instances of an array of records. The displacement is an offset to a field within the record. This is very similar except two-dimensional version of that. And this is the most complicated one, base plus index times scale plus displacement. Using all the address compo addressing components together allows efficient indexing of a two-dimensional array when the elements of the array are two, four, or eight bytes in size. Make sense? So I don't expect you to remember all this, but this is just to show you that what you provide in the ISA enables simpler mapping of an access pattern uh, to uh, instructions. Now you don't need many, many instructions to compute an address. You can just have a single instruction. Okay? So I find this part of the x86 manual very instructive. If you're interested in this, go, go ahead and read it. Okay, so there are many other ISA level trade-offs which we're not going to go into uh, in detail, but I'll uh, leave you with this. We're going to cover some of this when we get to uh, respective sections uh, in the course. For example, we'll, when we talk about VLIW uh, versus single instruction, that's a trade-off at the ISA level, right? Do you have a VLIW ISA or do you, do you have a scalar ISA? Scalar meaning, meaning you have a single instruction in your instruction bytes, whereas VLIW, uh, you have a long instruction. Each instruction is really multiple operations encoded in the instruction, multiple independent operations. Okay? Precise versus imprecise exceptions, we will cover that when we cover exceptions. And we've already talked about this, right? Do you actually, uh, does your execution model specify a von Neumann architecture? Meaning, do you know the precise state? Uh, virtual memory or SOT? That's, a, that's a part of the ISA also. Unaligned access, we will actually look at that uh, in the next few slides. Hardware interlocks versus software guaranteed interlocking. Does anybody know what this is? Yes? You uh, do? For the pipeline solid? Yes, that's right. We'll get to this. When we talk about pipelines, uh, when you pipeline instructions, you can have multiple instructions. Uh, you can fetch the later instruction before you finish the previous instruction. What if the later instruction is dependent on the previous instruction? Now the question is, does the hardware detect this? Or is it the job of the software to ensure that the later instruction doesn't move in the pipeline? Who guarantees correctness? Even if it's a choice that's made in the ISA. Okay? We'll get to that. In fact, I asked one question two lectures ago, I think. What does MIPS stand for? That's, that's one MIPS, <laughs> but the other MIPS, <laughs> the, 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 the MIPS that's, that's MIPS in terms of performance metric, but m what about MIPS uh, in terms of the ISA? Yes. Microprocessor without interlock pipeline stages. That's right, exactly. So interlock, that word comes in MIPS. When MIPS was designed, the goal was not to have any hardware interlocks, meaning when you pipeline the processor implementing a MIPS ISA, this, the idea is to have the hardware very simple. Hardware should not detect whether the next instruction you decode is dependent on the previous instruction. Microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. Who does guarantee that? Well, the software schedules instructions such that an instruction that is dependent on a previously fetched instruction that's in the pipeline does not get the wrong value. Make sense? This will become a lot more clear when we talk about pipelining, but this is just to warm you up. Okay? Okay, uh, page fault handling will cover this when we cover virtual memory. Again, this is part of the ISA. Does the hardware manage this? Does the software manage this? You could say the hardware manages it, and you could actually have that part of your ISA. In fact, x86 has support for hardware managing all page fault handling operations, uh, which we will not go into. 
but you can have you can look at chap, uh, volume three of the x86 ISA if you're interested in that. It's a beautiful volume also. <laughs> okay, cache coherence. Even this could be part of your ISA, and we will cover that also. So if you do not know uh, what this is, uh, how many of you know what cache coherence is? Four, five, six people. Do you cover that in 213? Or do you? 418. 418. Okay, 418, yeah. But 418 is not a prerequisite for this course. But we will get to cache coherence. But I'll give you the basic problem. The basic problem is if you have multiple processors, processor one, processor two, and each one has its own cache, cache one, cache two, and you have memory. Let's say you have a memory location x. Both uh, x has value 10 in it. Both processors read x. x gets cached in each of the caches. Now one processor decides to write to x. x becomes 1,000 here. Well, now you have inconsistent values of x in different caches, right? Should this processor read x and get value 10, or should this processor read x and get value 1,000? It should get value 1,000, right, because this is the most up-to-date value. The question is, who guarantees this? Is it the responsibility of the hardware to guarantee that when this processor writes 1,000 to x, this cache is updated such that this becomes 1,000? Or in some way, is it the responsibility of the hardware to guarantee that P1 gets the correct value? Or is it the responsibility of the software? Now, for if you say it is the responsibility of the hardware to guarantee this, meaning guarantee that every processor gets the correct value in the presence of these caches, then the programmer's job is a lot easier. Right? The programmer doesn't need to worry about this coherence, keeping consistent values in the caches. If you say it's the job of the programmer, then the programmer's job is much, much harder. So this is a very critical choice that you make, again, as a hardware designer. Yes? But uh, if you leave it to the hardware, and both the processors write at the same time, That's right. And the hardware somehow needs to arbitrate, right? So we will cover that when we talk about multiprocessors. You somehow need to arbitrate and ensure a good ordering. So we'll talk about that. You're getting into interesting topics. But you can actually look at the older lectures if you're interested in that. <laughs> Uh, so just, just one case in point, uh, there are actually processors that are implemented where the software, uh, hardware does not guarantee cache coherence. Now it's not called a cache, it's called a scratch pad memory. Basically, processors have the scratch pad memory that the programmer needs to manage. And the programmer basically brings data from memory into the scratch pad of processor 2, let's say. And if the programmer actually brings the same data into the scratch pad of processor 1, the programmer needs to ensure that that data is kept coherent. In fact, uh, one common architecture that's used in uh, gaming stations, like IBM cell architecture. How many of you are familiar with this? Not necessarily know the details of the architecture, but Justin knows. That's good. You can ask Justin if you don't know what. No, I just wanted to add another architecture yeah. that doesn't maintain cache coherence. Yeah. ARM. ARM. Really? Yeah. Even, so, even in the latest versions? Maybe some they, have they have caches in the latest version, so they do maintain cache coherence. Yeah. But there are some ARM architectures. Yeah, there could be old architectures. But Cell uh, did not maintain cache coherence, and this was one of the reasons why it was very, very hard to program. So if you contrast, uh, contrast this with uh, other processors like Xbox, which did maintain cache coherence in its caches, it was a lot easier, even for the programmers that are experts, like gaming programmers, gamers, to program th those architectures. So this is a choice that's very important. And we will, we will cover methods of ensuring this. And in your last lab, actually, you'll implement a protocol for ensuring this in hardware. How do you keep the caches coherent? OK. OK, and dot, dot, dot. There are actually millions of choices that you can make here. OK, so I think I've already given you an example here, programmer versus microarchitect. Many ISA features are designed to aid programmers but complicate the hardware designer's job. And you can imagine the hardware designer's job is actually complex now. In fact, these protocols, these coherence protocols, the more complicated you make them, the more complicated they get to verify. 
there are a lot of bugs in these protocols and hardware because the hardware designer may not be able to get it right. And you can see some of those bugs in the errata sheets of the processors related to the coherence protocols. There, there aren't a lot there, not to exercise in many cases, but they're tough to get right. Because, because of the reason that you suggested, actually. What, if, what happens when multiple things are trying to modify the same value? Now you get into race conditions that the hardware designer needs to handle well. And if they miss some conditions, then you may get the wrong value. OK? Uh, and you will see some of this when you implement your lab also. I'm sure you'll run into some race conditions when you implement the MESI <laughs> protocol in your last lab. Uh, so virtual memory is, is another example, actually. This is uh, perhaps uh, one of the most fundamental examples. Uh, should, is it the programmer's job to be concerned about the size of the code blocks fitting your physical memory? Meaning, should the programmer worry about did the code I write fit physical memory? Or is it the hardware's job to provide the illusion that you have infinite memory? Well, if the programmer has the illusion that you have infinite memory, it's a lot nicer for the programmer, right? They don't need to deal with the case where you're trying to execute some code, but it's not in physical memory. If the programmer needs to deal with that, they do what was called overlay programming which means that they need to bring in the code that they're going to execute into physical memory first, and then, and that's part of the program. Now, later, this became part of the system functions. And later, this was added to hardware as support uh, for virtual memory. So virtual memory is another fundamental example. And its key benefit is really for the uh, software designer, for the programmer. It makes programmers' job easier. Addressing modes is another example. Unaligned memory access. Uh, is another example. If you have fewer addressing modes, then you don't give a lot of flexibility to the programmer. But it's, virtual memory is a lot more stronger in terms of its effect, right? So if you, if you actually get a question, what's the biggest benefit of virtual memory? It's really for the software programmer. Uh, it's not really for performance. It's not really for anything. It's really the productivity of the programmer. OK, unaligned memory access. Uh, this is another example. If you don't support unaligned memory access, now the compiler or, or the programmer needs to align the data or the instructions. Let's take a look at uh, one example of this. What does alignment mean? Basically, alignment means that data values need to be aligned at boundaries. Boundaries, what are boundaries? For example, in MIPS, uh, some instructions, load word and store word, need to operate on data that's aligned uh, at the boundaries of four bytes. So if you think of all memory, this is your memory, you can divide it into chunks of four bytes. And that's kind of what I did, did over there. Bytes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, these instructions are not designed to fetch memory bytes that are not aligned, that are not within this byte. So if you give it an address that starts at byte 0, that's not aligned at the 4-byte boundary, right? And how do you figure out whether an address is aligned at the 4-byte boundary? Any ideas? Let's say you get an address, and this is a byte address. Divide by 4, right? Or shift by 2. <laughs> Let's make it easier. Uh, yeah, you, you just check the last two bits, right? You divide by 4, that's, that gives you the address at the 4-byte boundary. But if you just check the last two bits, or you could do this, right? Mod by 4, which is checking the last two bits, really. And if this is equal to, uh, I guess, 0, then you're aligned at the word boundary. OK, so load word and so, uh, store word, they're not designed to rotate unaligned bytes into registers, which means that if, you, if this calculation does not evaluate to 0 when you, when you calculate the address, then you get an exception. But uh, MIPS actually provides, so for example, in this case, we want to access uh, a word starting from byte 3. We want to access byte 3, 4, 5, 6. That's our word with a little endian word. Load word, store word, you cannot do that. But MIPS actually provides separate opcodes for this infrequent case where you may want to do that. 
you may want to actually uh, load this unaligned word. So how do you do that? Well, I think you'll implement this in your lab also, but there, there are two instructions, load word left and load word right. What load word left does is it can, uh, let's see, what did I do here? Byte four, byte, yeah. Basically load word left, you give it uh, the address that's starting from here, byte six, and uh, this takes uh, the, t uh, the aligned portion of that, uh, so you're starting from byte six, right? Six, five, four. It takes these bytes and puts them at, as part of the higher part of the word. Make sense? I think you should take a look at the load word left uh, description. But basically, it takes the address and it takes the aligned portion and puts it as part of the most significant bytes. And then if you do load word right to the second part of the instruction that's not aligned, the uh, second part of the data, word that's not aligned, basically you need to take the words uh, that are part of the se second word first and do a load word left, and then you need to take the uh, byte that is part of the first word and do a load word right. Basically, the programmer now needs to piece together the word from different aligned locations. That's what's happening here. Make sense? If you, you do a load word left to piece together the top three bytes, and then you do a load word right to piece together the bottom byte. So you use two instructions, which is slower, right? Is that clear? Whereas if you had hardware do this, you could have just said, I don't have an alignment restriction. I'm just going to tell the hardware to fetch. And in this case, I think little endian and big endian confuses things. I'm going to just fetch the word at byte six, right? In that case, what the hardware would do is, or I'm going to just fetch the word starting at byte three. In that case, what the hardware would do is, it would take byte three, byte four, byte five, byte six, and put it into a register. That's it. However, in this case, because the uh, hardware doesn't provide that support, it's the programmer's job to piece together different parts of the word that are not aligned across the word boundary using two instructions. Any questions on this? Yeah. OK. So what is, uh, I guess, what is the disadvantage of this? Not aligned, not, ha not having an alignment, uh, not having instructions that can align, uh, uh, al align words that are not aligned at particular boundaries. We're losing one cycle. Yeah, you're more than one cycle, right? <laughs> because now you need to fetch two instructions, right? So you're doing two instructions, whereas one instruction could have done the job for you. But yes, that's exactly the downside. And also, there's another thing. Again, if you look at the programmer, now the programmer needs to worry about this. Right? Now the programmer needs to care about where the words are. Whereas if you just place your data in memory without any alignment restriction, the programmer doesn't need to worry about that at all. Right? So you lose performance, also you lose programmer productivity. Now the compiler can cover some of this because we have this layers of abstraction, but still the compiler writer now needs to worry about that. OK, so if you look at x86, the choice is you can have unaligned access in x86. Load store instructions automatically align data that spans a word boundary. So in this case, if you have a load store instruction, and if you give it the beginning address of 3, uh, and if you say you, uh, you want to read a word from byte 3, you just get this word in your register. And the programmer compiler doesn't need to worry about where the data is stored. So if you, you can read this, but one thing I'd like to point to, however, to improve the performance of programs, data structures should be aligned on natural boundaries whenever possible. Right. Why? Because if, uh, if the data is not aligned like this, the hardware needs to do something like this internally. Right. It still need to, needs to access different parts of a word. Now when we cover DRAM, you will see that this may not be that bad. 
because when you read or when we cover caches, you'll see that this may not be that bad because data doesn't get stored as words in locations. You actually store bigger chunks of data, like a cache line in locations. So this alignment restriction is gone in today's architectures. It was a, a problem in, let's say, yesterday's or 20 years ago architectures where data was actually uh, stored in little chunks in places. Now, if you imagine a cache line, that's 64 bytes. Why do you really need to issue uh, two instructions to get four bytes out of those 64 bytes? If your hardware can provide any four bytes within that cache line, that's fast, right? Okay, so that alignment restriction is, again, uh, it's, it's com it comes from historical reasons. Okay, so this may or may not be uh, true today, but Okay, so let's take a look at this also. Uh, let me see, do I want to cover this? So okay, I, I didn't give you the reason. Should be aligned on natural boundaries whenever possible. The reason for this is that the processor requires two memory access to make an online memory access. Aligned access require only one memory access. And this is not always true also, if the data is in your cache. Because your cache stores data that's within the uh, boundaries of 64 bytes, let's say. But now you're accessing data that's eight bytes. And if the hardware supports that, you can get that in one cycle. OK. OK. Uh, I'll let you think about it. Uh, but if you look at x86, this is, I think, this gives you how things are aligned and not aligned. Uh, these are bytes, words, double words, quad words, and du double quad words in memory. And you could start any of these at any location. This is. Uh, just for you to take a look at. For example, uh, if you have a word at address 1h, a word is, I think, two bytes. You basically, uh, sorry, it's four bytes. You basically get cb31 in your register. And you could have a word that starts at address 2h. You see that this is not aligned, right? Both of them cannot be aligned at the same time. Uh, and that contains 74 cb. And the hardware supports all of this. OK. I think I'll leave you with this. Uh, we've already covered some of this, but there are pros of having no restrictions on alignment, and there are cons of having no restrictions on alignment. And filling in the above is an exercise for you. I think I've already given you the answers, except it's not written in the slides. OK? OK. So maybe we should take a five-minute break before we start the uh, microarchitecture basics. Let's come back at uh, 23 past 1. And um, yeah. the list of um, instructions in the handout loosely follow the MIPS cheat sheet that we have online. So um, well, that would probably take a lot of busy work because they're all, all specific in the cheat sheet. Which is this one. This is the MIPS cheat sheet. Oh, that's a better way to do it. That's what? That's a better way to do it than uh, I did it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Looking at the MIPS, the big, like, whatever, 100 page PDF. Oh, the, the, you're looking at the actual instructions at manual. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. was a mistake. Yeah, this, is, this is always a good thing. I, I, I only look at this one, actually, when I look at MIPS. <laughs> I do look at the ISA manual, too, but I think I, MIPS ISA manual is not as exciting as, or it's not as well written as some of the other ISA manuals. But yeah, this is, this is your friend during the course of this uh, class. And if you, if you treat him or her well, <laughs> the class will treat you well also. <laughs> okay, you, you all know what this is, right? This is the MIPS uh, cheat sheet. We, all, we have a copy, this is part of the book also. Okay, I think you're already recording, right? Okay, yeah, let's, uh, we'll get back to this actually. Let me put this here. So let's take a look at, now we've covered a lot of ISA trade-offs, not everything, of course, and we'll cover a lot more during the course of the lecture. Unaligned access is an interesting one, uh, and I'll let you think about it a little bit. Uh, and remember it when we come to memory. Uh, but let's take a look at how we implement the ISA now. We'll delve into the microarchitecture in the next few lectures. And as you know, implementing the ISA, microarchitecture is an implementation of the ISA, right? Basically, we're asking the question, how does a machine process instructions? And what does processing an instruction mean? If you remember the von Neumann model, uh, 
you have some state before an instruction is processed, and we called it the architectural or programmer visible state. Right? And you process an instruction, and we've covered the steps, right? You fetch the instruction, dot, 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 and we'll cover it again. And at the end, that architectural state is transformed to architectural state prime, which is the architectural or programmer visible state after an instruction is processed. Right? And processing an instruction is basically transforming this AS to AS prime. This should be, or you could call it A, A prime. Uh, I should fix this in the next version of the slides. According to the specification of the instruction in that manual, well, in this cheat sheet also, this cheat sheet also specifies how the instruction should operate. That's it, basically. So microarchitecture is all about how you do this process instruction step. Well, at least for a single instruction. So what's the difference between ISA and microarchitecture? ISA specifies abstractly what A prime, next architectural state, should be given an instruction and uh, an initial architectural state. Basically, it's an abstract finite state machine. You can think of it that way, right? Where state is the programmable visible state, and the next state logic is the instruction execution specification, right? Basically, from the ISA point of view, there are no intermediate states, right? You have state at the beginning of an instruction, state at the end for the von Neumann model. And you have one state transition per instruction. Now, this will lead us to an implementation. Microarchitecture implements how this A, or what I called AS here, is transformed into AS prime, A prime. There are many choices in implementation. And we can have programmer invisible state right, to optimize the speed of instruction execution. And we will see that. You can have multiple state transitions. You can have pipelining, for example. Or you can have microcoded execution. And we'll see those. For example, one choice is having no intermediate states. Transform A to A prime in a single clock cycle. Basically, execute the instruction in a single clock cycle. That's one choice that we will cover in this lecture. Another choice is to have to transfer uh, the initial state to an intermediate state, tra and then to another intermediate state, and then to another intermediate state, and then to AS prime. And AS prime is the programmable visible state, remember. Basically, take multiple clock cycles to transform the initial state to the final state. And this is called a multi-cycle architecture. And we'll cover that also. A very basic pro instruction processing engine is this. Implements choice one. Basically, each instruction takes a single clock cycle to execute. And you use only combinational logic to implement instruction execution, which means that there is no intermediate programmer with invisible state updates, right? Because everything is combinational now in the implementation of an instruction. This is basically it. Process an instruction in one clock cycle, and you get architectural state prime. Which means that a very basic processing engine looks like this. Right? It's a single cycle machine. It's basically sequential logic, which contains the architectural state. And that's fed into combinational logic. And at the end of the clock cycle, you get architectural state prime, which, which gets latched. And everything that's required to execute an instruction happens within this combinational logic. Nice. It's a nice, very nice abstraction, right? I guess one question for you is, what is the clock cycle time here determined by, in this case? That's right, exactly. Now, what is the critical path of the combinational logic determined by? Yes? That's right. And what is that determined by? <laughs> Absolutely. It is a delay on the gates. By the architect. That's right. So think about the instructions. Now you need to implement all of the instructions here. right? We'll get to this, I guess. You, you, you'll have some instruction that will take much longer, perhaps, right, than another if you implement everything in combinational logic. And to prime you, think about memory, for example. Think about, think about all memory as combinational now. You could have all combinational memory, potentially. Now, this, that's, that's one of the downsides of a single cycle engine, right? How do you incorporate memory here? But let's, let's ignore that issue for now. But in this case, your critical path can be very long. Because there may be an instruction that takes you know, thousands of seconds. 
I don't know if that's possible, but you can imagine an instruction that does that, right? Do you really want your uh, worst uh, critical path to be determined by that instruction? Probably not, right? And I've already given you the disadvantage of this architecture, but we'll still take a look at that because we can build uh, multi-cycle architectures uh, based upon this pipeline. Okay, so this is just to warm you up again. You have programmer visible architectural state, which is the memory and the registers and the program counter. Instructions basically specify how to transform the values of the programmer visible state. Single cycle machines, each instruction takes a single cycle. All state updates must be made at the end of the instruction cycles, uh, instructions execution. Big disadvantage, the slowest instruction determines your critical path, your clock cycle time. As a result, you have a long clock cycle time. So multi-cycle machines, instruction processing is brought, broken into multiple cycles or multiple stages. State updates can be made within the execution of an instruction. And architectural updates have to be made at the end of an instruction's execution because that's the programmable visible state, right? Advantage, now the slowest stage determines cycle time, right? It's not the slowest instruction, it's the slowest stage. And the microarchitect can now balance the stages, right? And we will see ways of doing that. But both of these literally follow the von Neumann model at the microarchitecture level, as I described them. Because the architectural state doesn't get exposed, uh, doesn't get updated until the instruction finishes. Okay. So this is, uh, we've already covered this very briefly on the, white, uh, on the blackboard in, a, in an earlier lecture. But what is an instruction processing cycle? Instructions are processed under the direction of a control unit step by step. And you will implement that control unit in your second lab, as well as the data path. Uh, an instruction cycle, not to be confused with a machine clock cycle, is the sequence of steps to process an instruction. Fundamentally, there are six phases, and you can actually, this is one of the readings that I've assigned, Pat and Patel, uh, book chapter four, that talks about these stages. You, f you need to fetch the instruction, decode the instruction, evaluate the address of the operands, fetch the operands, execute the instruction, and store the result. Now, not all instructions require all six steps, and we will see some of them. Uh, in a single, another way of thinking about it, this is a single cycle machine, all six phases, you can call each of these as phases, uh, all six phases of the instruction processing cycle take a single machine clock cycle to execute. Whereas in a multi-cycle machine, all six phases of the instruction processing cycle can take multiple machine clock cycles to execute. In fact, each phase can take multiple clock cycles to complete. And we will see this when we talk about microprogrammed implementation of the LC3B. You'll see that fetch takes many clock cycles to complete while you're accessing memory. And memory can be hundreds of clock cycles compared to the processor clock cycles. OK. So another way, uh, let's take a look at uh, instruction processing in some other way. Uh, basically, instructions transform some data to another uh, version of that data, architectural state to the next architectural state. This transformation is done by functional units. These are units that operate on data. And there's a distinction between these units that operate on data and some logic that tells these units what to do to the data. Right. And what is that distinction? These are, these are actually called the data path. Right? An instruction processing engine actually consists of two components. One is the data path. You've probably heard of this. Uh, that consists of hardware elements that deal with and transform the data signals. For example, functional units, adders, multipliers. Or hardware structures like wires and muxes that enable the flow of data into the functional units and registers. And storage units that store data, like registers. These are all parts of the data path. But these data path elements need to be controlled. Right? And that's the, it's the job of the control logic to tell the data path elements what to do to the data based on what the instruction that's executing is. And control logic consists of hardware elements that determine the control signals. These are the signals that specify what the data, data path elements should do to the data. Now, this is very basic. Uh, in your first lab, you'll actually build these two. And I guess in the rest of this lecture, we'll build a single cycle machine that does this. In a single cycle machine, these control signals that control the data path are generated in the same clock cycle as the data signals. Right. 
which means that, I mean, everything related to an instruction needs to happen in a single cycle. So a control signal must be generated in that cycle, right? Um, now, there's a disadvantage to this, right? You generate the control signals, which may take time, and they control the data path, which may take some other time. Maybe generation of control signals should be parallelized with the generation of data signals. That's another disadvantage of the single cycle machine, right? That's another way of uh, improving the performance of a machine. But we'll get to multi-cycle machine. In a multi-cycle machine, control signals needed in the next cycle can be generated in the previous cycle, right? Because you're taking multiple cycles to do this. Which means that, this is a very fundamental again, which means that you can overlap the latency of control processing with the latency of data path operation. You generate the control signals in the next cycle uh, for, for, the, uh, for the operations that you're going to do in the next cycle. Right. This will become a lot more clear when we talk about microcoded machines, but uh, this is very fundamental also. Keep this in mind. Okay, I guess I already told you that. So there are many ways of designing the data path and control logic. Single cycle, multi-cycle, pipelines. Uh, and we'll see these. And you'll see in your homework question that you'll have different kinds of data paths. You can have single bus versus multi-bus data paths. And these all affect what your architecture in the end looks like. You can have a single bus, for example, connecting all the data path elements. Versus you can have many different buses that connect different parts of the data path elements. Now, what would be the advantage of a single bus over having many different buses? Yes, everything is reachable from every other place. With a single bus, that's right. But with many different buses, you can guarantee that too, right? You just ensure that. More complicated. <laughs> that's right, exactly, more complicated, absolutely. So that's the fundamental difference, right? If you have a single bus, it's cheaper. So you can save hardware cost. If you have multiple buses, then it's more complicated. But what is the advantage of having multiple buses? There must be a reason, right? Yes? That's right, exactly. You can, you can do multiple things at the same time, and we will see that. Whereas if you have a single bus, you can transfer only one thing from one place to the other place. Whereas if you have multiple of these, you can transfer multiple things concurrently. Right. OK, so you will see your homework two question. Another choice is, do you implement the control logic as hardware or combinational, or do you have a microcode and microprogram control? We'll cover that again. Control signals generated by combination logic versus control signals stored in a memory structure. You'll see both of these. And uh, of course, these are tightly coupled, right? If you have a, a control logic that controls a data path, that control uh, structure of the signals and, and how they're generated depend on the data path design. Right? And let's take a look at them now. But uh, uh, flash forward a little bit. You have a homework question. Uh, related to performance analysis, so I want to give you a flash forward. Since we've kind of covered the basics of single cycle versus multi-cycle microarchitectures. Uh, if you think about the performance of these two different machines, remember single cycle uh, architecture, you have one clock cycle that's determined by the slowest instruction. Multi-cycle, your clock cycle is determined by the slowest stage. So execution time of an instruction, you can view that as this. Clock cycle time times the number of cycles taken to execute that instruction, cycles per instruction. CPI is your cycles per instruction. In a single cycle machine, what is the value of this? One, right? Because by definition, an instruction takes single cycle to execute, which means that the only determinant of the execution time of an instruction is the clock cycle time. Whereas in a multi-cycle machine, the cycles per instruction can be different. It could be 20, maybe. Now your clock cycle time is different also. Okay, So that's the fundamental trade-off between single cycle versus multi-cycle machines. You can optimize either of these. Uh, in a multi-cycle machine. In a single cycle machine, you have no choice. Cycles per instruction is one. You made that choice already. Whereas clock cycle time, well, 
you have to optimize that. But now that the optimization of that depends on what's your slowest instruction. So let's build upon this. Execution time of a program is now you can sum this over all instructions, right? Assuming you're executing one instruction at a time. This is a very basic performance model. Or, looked another way, uh, you can have number of instructions times the average cycles per instruction for that program times clock cycle time. Right? This is basically some, uh, this one expressed in another way, assuming you have this average cycles per instruction for that program. Okay? Which means that if you want to, this is the execution time. If you want to minimize the execution time, now, now you have three degrees of freedom, right? You can minimize the clock cycle time, minimize the average CPI, cycles per instruction, and these are parts of your design, right, microarchitecture, or you could minimize the number of instructions you execute. Right? Now these are all parts, and this is where ISA also interacts with microarchitecture. You can have a complex instruction that reduces the number of instructions, but a complex instruction may increase your average cycles per instruction, right? Because it may take more cycles to execute that complex instruction if you have a multi-cycle architecture. If you have a single cycle architecture, this is out of the picture, right? Now you have number of instructions times clock cycle time. You can have a complex instruction, number of instruction goes down, but if you have a complex instruction that you're trying to execute in a single cycle, very likely your clock cycle time goes up. In a sense, there is no free lunch. You're trying to optimize these things, and these things are interacting in different ways. When one is going up, the other is going down, depending on, your, on the choices you make in the ISA and the microarchitecture. Okay, single cycle microarchitecture performance and multi-cycle performance, I've already told you this. Single cycle microarchitecture, CPI is one, clock cycle time is long. Multi-cycle microarchitecture, CPI is different for each instruction now. You have that freedom. And hopefully, the average CPI, you can design the machine such that it's small. And clock cycle time, well, now you can make it short. Right? You can make it have a much higher frequency design. You've increased your degree of freedom with a multi-cycle microarchitecture. OK? So this is a flash forward for you for performance analysis. But really, you don't really need to do no more than this to answer the homework question. Homework question basically uh, te tests your understanding of how these different things interact. OK? But we'll get back to this once we cover single cycle micro architecture. This will be the slide where, I, where I'll ask you what is the downside of the multi, uh, single cycle micro architecture? Yes? In the homework, they were talking about IPCs and they the That's right, exactly. Yes. Maybe, maybe you need to make that transformation. IPC is the inverse of CPI. And we'll have a conversation about that when we talk about uh, machines that execute multiple instructions per cycle. That's another way of improving this average CPI, right? You execute multiple instructions per cycle. In a given cycle, you have, let's say, 10 instructions. And by definition, your average CPI goes down if you can do that. So it's fun, actually. You can think of many different ways. Maybe you can. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I encourage you to think of different ways of redu reducing these different components, because this is where you can actually create new microarchitectures, potentially. So people imagined uh, reducing the CPI by executing multiple instructions per cycle. And that's how they came up with superscalar architectures. Maybe we'll come up with something totally different. I don't know what they would be. OK. So let's take a closer look. I'll go through this relatively fast, because I think the basic concepts are relatively clear. Uh, hopefully, to you, uh, or you can learn them by looking at the slides. And you're going to design this anyway <laughs> in lab two. But this is just to help you with lab two. Single cycle machine looks like this, right? So let's, let's build a single cycle machine. Uh, not, not in a very formal way, but uh, in a way that just teaches you basic con uh, concepts. Let's start with the data path elements. Let's start with the state elements. You have a program counter. You have a register file. And you have, I guess, instruction memory and data memory. And we're going to assume that these are kind of magic, because that's, that's what single cycle machines are, <laughs> in a sense. But hopefully, this will be instructive still. 
So yeah, we will assume you have magic memory and register file, which means that you have a combinational read. You uh, output of the read data port is a combinational function of the register file contents and the corresponding read select port. So you don't have sequential weights. Similarly for memory. Uh, synchronous write, also the selected register is updated on the positive edge of the clock transition when write enables asserted. Okay? Basically, you cannot affect read output in between clock edges. And we're going to assume single cycle synchronous memory. Okay? Uh, and contrast this later uh, with memory that tells when the data is ready, which is asynchronous memory, right? It's not single cycle anymore. It could be many, many cycles. So memory can have a ready bit indicating the read or write is done. You give an address to memory and keep polling that ready bit. And one, one that ready, once that ready bit is set, you know that you have the data. Whereas here, we're going to assume that everything is synchronous. Memory doesn't have that ready bit. After some amount of time, you'll get the data. OK? So instruction processing, we're going to build a data path as well as the control logic. You have five generic steps. I reduced that six to five to fit on the slide. But you can, you can figure out what I, what I actually reduced here. The reason I reduced it is because I'm going to optimize it for MIPS. And in MIPS, uh, register operand fetch uh, and instruction decode actually can be overlapped, almost. So we, we're going to look at instruction fetch, instruction decode, and register operand fetch. Execute and evaluate memory address. Actually, in MIPS, this can be overlapped also relatively easily uh, because the instructions are simple. Uh, and you, we're going to do a memory operand fetch, and we're going to store and write back the result or write back the result. And this is our basic data path. So fetch happens here. Instruction decode and register file read happens here. Execute or address generation happens here. After you have the address, you can access memory here. And write back happens here, either from the register or memory, depending on the instruction. Right. I'm going through this relatively fast, but I'm assuming it's OK with everyone. Right? Yes? If it's not OK, raise your hand or shout or scream. Nobody's shouting yet. OK. <laughs> OK. So what is to come in the end and what you're going to kind of implement, it doesn't have, look, have to exactly look like this in your lab too, is something like this. This is the full data path of a subset of instructions and in MIPS. And I guess we've omitted some instructions here. Actually, we've omitted a lot of other instructions too. But this is what's going to come. And this part is the control logic. It takes the instruction upcode and generates some control signals. And your job, part of your job is to implement this control logic that controls. And you see that the control logic feeds these control signals to different data path elements. Data path is the black part. So for example, this MUXIS control is ALU source. Which source should the ALU select? Should the ALU select the source from the second port, second output port of the register file? Or should it select it from this wire? And where does that wire come from? It takes the bottom 16 bits of the instruction and signed extends it. And that's the wire, which is basically an immediate, right? Sign extended immediate. OK? And now you can imagine what determines that, right? Whether the instruction is I type or R type determines that, right? I type meaning is the second operand an immediate, or R type is the second operand as a register. Right? OK, now you can generate those control signals. It's fun. Let's take a look at this for arithmetic and logical instructions. Uh, this is an R-type ALU instruction. Let's take a look at how the data path works for those instructions. And this is what the instruction looks like. This is really where your opcode is. Actually, this is the opcode, but this is the function, as MIPS calls it. Uh, and basically, you can think of the instruction to be interpreted. You can think of a machine that interprets the instruction this way. If the memory location at this program counter is equal to this, add rd, rs, rt, then the machine should do this. Our, uh, the value of destination should be the value of the source plus uh, the other source, rt. 
uh, and program counter should be incremented. So we need to have control and data path elements to do this. And this is simple, right? You need to be able to fetch the instruction. Oh. And now uh, different parts of the instruction bits are input as register addresses. Well, obviously, uh, register source are these five bits. I should have labeled these bits. But basically, bits 21 through 25 are for the first source. Bits 20 through 16 are for the second source. And bits 15 through 12 are for, that should be 11, right? I believe it should be 11. OK. I cannot read that very well. But <laughs> those are for the destination register. And, uh, and for this instruction to execute correctly, this register write signal should be asserted. And the ALU operation should be set to add. Right? That's simple. And you get these from uh, the uh, bits from the instruction. And this register write signal needs to be generated by the control logic. Now if you want to add I-type ALU instructions to this data path, the data path will need to become a little bit more complex. Because now the second operand is not a register, but it's a sign extended immediate. So how do we do that? Well, we'll need to somehow add the sign extended immediate as the second operand. It's not this register anymore. But we would like to execute the same different instructions on the same data path, so we need to add a mux. Right? And the mux specifies whether the second operand is a register or a sign extended immediate. And this control signal is the instruction I type determines whether you select uh, the register or the immediate. And this control signal is set to pick the register if the instruction is R type and set to pick the immediate if the instruction is I type. Make sense? And, well, I guess this is part of the ugliness you may be referring to. Uh, I, I find this a little bit ugly, but there's no way around it, maybe. If you look at this, now your destination register is different depending on R type and R I type, right? If your R type, the destination register comes, is specified by bits 20 through 16. And if it's I type, the destination, uh, oh, it's the other way around, actually. See, I get confused also. Uh, if, you're, if this is I type, the destination register is this. But if the instruction is an R type instruction, the, this is a source register, right? The destination register is somewhere within these immediate bits. So there's a mux that's added to appropriately select the destination register ID based on whether it's I type or uh, R type. OK? This is simple, right? And you're going to design this data path uh, in lab two and the control logic. So you can look at the data path for data movement instructions as well. What does that look like? Basically, this is a load word. Uh, what it does is it takes. Uh, the base register adds to it a sign extended offset, accesses memory using that, and puts the value into a general purpose register and increments a program counter. And we're not going to implement the translate step yet. Because MIPS has virtual memory, you actually translate. Uh, what the effective address that's calculated is actually a virtual address, and that needs to be translated to a physical address. We'll cover that when we, go, uh, when we get to virtual memory. Okay. So what should the data path for this look like? Now the data path is becoming a little bit more complicated. This is how you execute a load. Uh, well, load destination is uh, RT, which is, this is an I-type instruction, right? So load is I-type. So destination register is selected accordingly. But we need to compute the memory address. To compute the memory address, the ALU needs to add the base register which is this part, so we can still read that register, to the sign extended offset, which is basically, because it's an I-type instruction, selecting the bottom input of this MUX. So we already have this data path to calculate the address. And we already have the data path to write to the destination register. We just need to be able to read the memory. So load does memory read. Actually, this should be connected. This ALU result should be connected to the address. And write data, you're not going to write to memory. So this is set to 0. This is set to 1. Memory write is set to 0. Memory read is set to 1. And the result is read data. And that read data is connected to this write data. Right. Make sense? 
So that's how you build a simple engine. So store instruction, again, similar, except we're going to do a store instead of a load. This part is reversed, right? OK, so how do you do that? Basically, we need to disable the writing into the register file because we're not going to write to the register file. That's signal set to 0. Everything else is the same as the load instruction, control signals. Here, the control signals are reversed. Memory write is set to 1, and memory read is set to 0. And the data path needs to connect uh, the register that we read into uh, uh, the memory. And what is that register? You know that it's RT, right? Does that make sense? OK. Now you can combine load and store together, so you'll have a more complicated uh, data path. Now this, this actually combines all of them, all of the data uh, path. Uh, depending, uh, both of these are I types, so we always select the bottom one. Uh, but uh, let's see, what's the difference? I guess I've already given you this. The, the main thing is now you can change the control signals to is store or is load. And I'm going to give you the control signals later on. If the instruction is a store, memory write is enabled, register write is disabled. If the instruction is a load, then memory read is enabled. And for a load, is load is true, is store is false. For a store, is store is true, is load is false. OK. Uh, so this is the final data path for non-control flow instructions. This is for load, store, and if you add uh, ALU operations for it, you need to add another MUX, it turns out. Why? Because loads and stores, uh, well, at least loads, read the data from memory and write it to a register. But if you want to use the same data path also for ALU operations, now data can come from the result of the ALU, right? So an ad needs to be able to write its data from here to here. So if the, you have a MUX that selects the input of the uh, write data port of the register file from either the ALU result or the read output of memory. And this MUX is controlled by w uh, this control signal that says whether or not the instructions are load. OK? So it's fun. You can, you can design more complicated microarchitectures. So why are we doing this? Well, we're trying to reuse a lot of data path components for different instructions, right? An alternative to this is not to deal with all of these MUXs and actually have different data paths for different instructions. Well, that's probably not a good choice because it's very expensive. Right? We're really uh, using, minimizing the hardware we have and amortizing the cost of data path components across different instructions. This may not be the only choice. right? If you want to execute multiple instructions per cycle, maybe you do want to provide multiple data paths, multiple ALUs. And we'll get to that. OK, control flow instructions, these are also relatively simple, but they're going to operate on some other part of the pipeline. This is your jump that you're going to implement. Target address is relatively simple. You take the program counter and concatenate it with the immediate, and this is what you get. Well, this was the earlier data path. We're not going to touch this part, but we're going to touch this part. Right? So earlier data path, of course, these should, uh, uh, when, when you execute an unconditional jump, you shouldn't be writing to the register file. right? You shouldn't be writing to memory. And hopefully, you shouldn't be reading from memory. Actually, you could be reading from memory. You could set the signal to x, right? But then you're going to discard the result. Why read from memory uh, if, you're not, if, you, if your instruction doesn't specify that? So you can save energy. So a lot of what we will discuss in this course will be related to performance. But think about the energy implications of the design choices also. And when it, whenever it becomes relevant, I'll tell you some of those. But basically, jump operates this way. You take some bytes from the instruction, concatenate it with some bytes from the program counter, or some bits from the program counter, and input it to the PC. Well, now PC has a MUX in front of it. You don't always increment the PC. But if you have a jump instruction, you take this input, and that's how you update the program counter. And that MUX is controlled by this control signal that says is jump. This will become more complicated later. If you have a jump instruction, you should select this input to the MUX. Well, this is not the only kind of jump. There is also jump register, jump and link, and jump and link register. Now that makes the data path more complicated. And if you want to look at these, for example, jump register doesn't 
change the PC to this value, but jump register does this. You can imagine what that is, right? I guess jump register does this. PC equals register file, I'll call it general purpose register file, RS. Basically, you need to register, read the register file and place the value in the register file to the program counter. Well, how does that change your data path? I'll let you think about it. Well, I, I guess I have it here. <laughs> well, I'll let you think about the control signal, though. It's, not, it's no more is jump, right? <laughs> now, you need to distinguish with, with the other one. Uh, well, uh, there's also a jump and link register. I guess let's take a look at that, too. Uh, jump and link register. In addition to doing this, uh, oh, yeah, I guess jump and link registers. In addition to doing this, you also do this. You do PC equals, it's not here actually, it's not on this cheat sheet. So the cheat sheet failed me. <laughs> That's why you really should look at the MIPS ISA. It does have the jump and link, but it doesn't have the jump and link register. I wonder if they got rid of it in this cheat sheet or if they got rid of it from the ISA. But the idea is basically this, link register. Uh, now your program counter, uh, oh, now your R31 gets PC plus 8. Make sense? Why? Remember the uh, JSR jump to subroutine in uh, LC3B that we discussed? We're saving the next program counter or link address into register 31. In LC3B, we were saving it to R7. This is, a, this, this is to enable subroutine calls. Well, this has an implication on the data path. Now you need to uh, have something that implements this, right? And what is that? Well, I guess I'll let you figure this one out. <laughs> you basically somehow need to have the incremented piece. This is actually wrong, but that's intentional. Because if I gave you all the data path, then what's the fun of doing lab two, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you need to take PC plus eight and write it into a register here. Now you can imagine that this part is going to become more complicated, right? Because now you have to pick R31 as your destination. And R31 was not a, des not a potential destination, potential address for the write register before. It was either RT bits from the instruction or RD bits from the instruction. Now you have another input saying R31, hard-coded 31. And that is selected if you have a link register. Okay? Okay, conditional branch instructions, now we're going to have more fun. <laughs> and these will become even more fun when we get to, um, uh, when we get to pipeline arch microarchitectures, yes? The link register, I think you might want to link the register before you jump to the the location of the general purpose register. That's right, absolutely, yes. So what I did here, what Justin is saying nicely is that I screwed up on the board. <laughs> so the ordering of these operations is this is first, this is second, right? Yeah, you cannot, the, and the ISA should not specify it this way because you don't change the PC and then jump uh, and then save it. You save the PC and then change the program counter, right? Good, thank you. Okay, so conditional branch instructions. Uh, this is the encoding of the instruction. And the way the, uh, a conditional branch instruction operates is basically you compute a target address, and this is going to get a little bit hairy with branch delay slots, which you'll need to learn about. I'll not cover it right now. Uh, for the sake of uh, brevity. But you basically take program counter plus four plus the sign extended immediate times four, because branches are aligned, jump to a word aligned location. And the program ch counter is changed to this target address if these two registers are equal. The values in those two registers are equal. This is a branch equal instruction, branch if equal. There are other sorts of branches. Branch, uh, let me see. Branch on not equal also. But let's implement this one first. 
if these registers are not equal, if the condition is not satisfied, then program counter is just incremented to the next address. Now you'll need to think about the branch delay slots, but uh, let's take a look at how you will do that. Well, we'll need to read register R, R, RS and RT, and we'll need to somehow compare them, right? So the ALU operation should be subtract. And there should be some logic that checks the result of the subtract. Is it zero or is it not zero? Now you, have, you need to have data path elements to do that, right? Now the output of that logic, uh, well here, uh, well of course we shouldn't write the registers, you already know that, right? Because this instruction is not writing to the register. But uh, depending on the output of the subtract, whether it's zero or not, we're going to select a different source from the program uh, for, to input into the program counter. And the source could be, let's see, PC is target. Some, somehow we need to have a target address computation. Yeah, there you go. This is the branch address target, right? So we have another adder here that takes the immediate, shifts it left by two, and gets PC plus four, and adds these things together. So this is your target address. And depending on the output of your ALU, you either select this target address or you select PC plus four. And this becomes a little bit more complicated if you add the jump instructions to it, right? Okay, so you'll need to design the control signals that ensure that this operates correctly in the presence of all these different instructions. Now you need to be a little bit more careful because uh, we have delayed branches, but we'll cover that later. So the idea is, this is actually a mistake in the MIPS architecture, and we'll cover why that is so uh, when we get to it. The idea is, when you do a branch equal dot dot dot, the next instruction that comes after the branch is always executed. This is called the branch delay slot. So branch doesn't take effect until this instruction finishes. You compute the target address of the branch here, and you decide, let's say, you, you, uh, let's say the, tar uh, the condition is such that the target should be executed. The program counter is changed to the target not at the end of this branch instruction, but after the next instruction is done. Does that make sense to you guys? So normally if you don't have a branch delay slot, this is called a branch delay slot. If you do not have this, normally what should happen is when you compute the target address, and the branch specifies that the control flow should change to the target, condition is such that the control flow should change to the target, the next instruction that's executed should be this add instruction that's at the target, right? But with a branch delay slot, this branch takes effect after the next sequential instruction finishes. So you execute the branch, you determine the target address, and then you have to execute the multiply and then jump to the target. Can you guys guess why this is here? Yes. And to reduce interval? Yes. So that's, one of the, that's the reason, actually. Meaning, it takes time to decide whether or not you will branch to the target. And if you have a pipeline machine, let's say you have a two-stage pipeline, uh, let's say, let's say uh, well, you don't know about pipelining, but I think you can imagine. Let's say you fetch the instruction, and then in the second stage, you execute the instruction and do everything else related to it. Let's say you fetch the branch here, branch equal. You fetched it, you decoded it, but you haven't determined the target address yet. You don't know the target address. In the next cycle, branch moves here. At the end of the cycle, you know the target address, and you know whether or not you should branch. Well, what do you fetch while you're figuring that out? No idea, right? Normally, you can stall the pipeline, but then you, get, you underutilize this part of the machine. So MIPS architects decided that you have a branch delay slot, meaning the next instruction that comes after the branch is always executed regardless of whether or not the branch is taken. 
Now you avoid the problem of what to fetch. This multiply, regardless of whether or not this branch is taken, is always executed. Now you've filled your pipeline. Right? Sounds beautiful, right? And the compiler somehow ensures that there is always an instruction. There's an instruction that's independent that has to be executed gets here. We'll cover this in a little bit more detail when we cover branch handling. So there is an upside to this if this works. Now the downside is it's a headache for the computer architect, right? Hardware designer. The hardware designer now needs to ensure that this operates correctly. Right? Yeah. OK. But this is called a delayed branch. Uh, and we'll, uh, think about the trade-offs related to it. Maybe you're thinking about the trade-offs. Yes? So uh, you're not going to execute the next instruction. You're only going to fetch it. No, you're going to execute it. That's the, that's the idea. The branch takes effect after this instruction is executed. I mean, according to the pipeline. Yeah. So branch goes out, multiply gets executed, and then you get the target instruction. And then the multiply finishes, the target instruction goes here, and then the next instruction after the target gets fetched. So the semantics is that the next instruction after the branch is always executed. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the semantics. It's an ISA level semantics. Yes? Oh, it shouldn't. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, you're, you're saying multiply edits a register that this ad is going to use. Yeah. So the compiler needs to ensure the program still operates correctly. Okay. Basically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> let, me t let me say it that way. <laughs> and if the compiler cannot find an instruction to place into this delay slot such that the semantics of the program is correct, what does the compiler do? Puts a no up there. Exactly. Because this is uh, ISA. E every branch needs to have this delay slot. Yes? Is the compiler allowed to turn a branch test? So that's a good question. Why don't you read the MIPS ISA and let me know? Spark ISA, I think there are cases where Spark disallows this. Spark is another ISA that, that, that has that. And the behavior is undefined if you have a branch in the delay slot. But I don't know about the MIPS ISA. Is it like that also in MIPS? OK. That's what Justin is saying. So the behavior is undefined. Yes? I'm sorry if you said this already, but does this apply only to branches or to jumps as well? So I believe it does apply to jumps also, right? It does apply to all control flow instructions. Because the, the reason is target address computation takes time. <laughs> but we'll see, uh, when we cover branch handling, we don't have time right now, but when we cover branch handling, we'll see the advantages and disadvantages of this. And uh, this is one case where disadvantages are so high that I can clearly tell you that this was a very bad choice in the, in the architecture to make. There's also something called a load delay slot, but that's, that's an even worse choice in the architecture. But you can think about why, the, why this is a disadvantage, right? Because there are other solutions to this problem, actually, that the architects did not necessarily think about. Or maybe they thought about it, but they got rid of it. So think about, OK, let me give you, I, I think, something to think about. Uh, we can cover that later on. You have one single delay slot. What if you have a deeper pipeline? You have fetch, you have decode, you have dot, 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 dot. Now you fetch the branch. Branch moves to the next stage. You still don't know the outcome of the branch. Branch moves to the next stage. You still don't know the outcome of the branch. Do you add more delay slots? Well, if you add more delay slots, you're changing the ISA. But you want to add more pipeline stages in your microarchitecture without changing the ISA. Right? That's the beauty of that interface. You can do things, change the microarchitecture uh, such that you speed up execution, but you don't want to affect the ISA. So the reason this is bad is this is tying the ISA to a particular implementation of microarchitecture. It works nicely, maybe, 
if you have two-stage pipeline. But once you go to 30-stage pipeline, it breaks. Because you still need to figure out a way to what, figure, uh, figure out a way to answer the question, what instruction should I fetch next? Because your branch is not resolved in the 30-stage pipeline yet. So you've added baggage to your ISA that tried to solve the branch problem, but it assumed a particular implementation, which was two-stage pipeline. There are other issues related to this. So let's assume that you came up with a branch, branch delay slot with variable delay slots. You're the architect, right? You can imagine. Let's say you can have five delay slots after a branch. Beautiful, right? Well, then the problem is, what are those five delay slots filled with? The compiler needs to be good enough to figure out five independent instructions to ensure semantically the program is correct. And it turns out, even if you have a single delay slot, programs have a lot of no-ops in those delay slots. Imagine five delay slots. How many no-ops you will have? So this is a bad idea. OK. Let's see. Oh, putting it all together. We're almost done. <laughs> We're almost on time also. So if you put it all together, uh, this is what you get. And I think I'll stop here. I'll leave these slides uh, as the backup slides for the control logic. And have a good weekend. See you next week. <laughs>